Hey, greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm actually going to go back a few years, actually a few decades, to back to where I was a dairy farmer. I've been with Extension for 21 years, but for 18 years I worked at the U.S. Naval Academy Dairy Farm, and so it's, been, it's interesting to go back and revisit this topic of hay and silage and, and evaluation. So hope you enjoy that. How many in here are, are working with dairy farmers or working with hay, hay, haylage, development, silage? So it'd be kind of a general overview of those things. This is the Naval Academy Dairy Farm. It's still actually actively farmed uh, by Sunrise Farms. I still have an office there, which is kind of amazing. I actually returned um, home to one of the milking barns there and turned it into an extension office. So it's kind of an interesting turn of events. But uh, you'll see that that's 88 crop strips. That's 846 acres. And probably the darker strips in there um, uh, that time of the year probably are the alfalfa. Okay, so again, uh, we had uh, about 100 acres of alfalfa. This is a favorite picture of mine because it's a forage-based program when you get into dairy and you're looking at alfalfa in the foreground and some alfalfa strips all the way over to the barns. This is about the center of the farm uh, at, the, at, the, at the property. It's still a beautiful place. Of course, corn silage and alfalfa haylage and bunkers and trenches and uprights and grain storage, all part of this process of making a TMR. How many of you have worked with TMR rations? Worked with any growers or anything with TMR? So maybe it's somewhat new to you. This is the finished product here. This is a TMR. We'll pass them around as they go. Uh, so this is kind of what we're shooting for, a fairly uh, valuable, I like to think that uh, when we make a total mixed ration, that every bite counts. And when it comes to every bite, we, we want uh, uh, to convert it into milk, right? And energy for the cow itself, and of course replacement stocks. And here's a typical ration, and as you notice, it's 21.8% alfalfa, 6.4% dry hay, and that's usually very high quality alfalfa, uh, corn silage, and then of course you throw in all the meal and the uh, bicarb and everything else that goes into a TMR to make that complete um, mouthful counts, if you will, for each, each chew, essentially, is going to turn that into energy for the cow and lactation. And so it's 70% forage based. And so I think that's pretty typical of dairy farming, um, you know, and even, even probably even beef farming were forage based, right? And so first thing is that I'm going to share with you some samples, and I think they came out of the Cumberland Valley Analytical Services. I think that's the one that's on there. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But any, uh, anyway, the, uh, you, have, you can see it on top. Maybe it's Waypoint. Um, National Forage Testing Association, a lot of places test, but I just went to this, re, uh, re, this site just a week or two ago and pulled down who's certified in our area. And of course, I kind of looked in my area, Central Maryland area. And uh, that's the, the list that came up uh, for our Maryland farmers that's close and that are certified. And I think that's very important that you choose a certified laboratory uh, when you get your samples done. So, and they'll tell you, they'll do you step by step how to get through that process once you visit their website. So. Here's typically we think about making high quality silages and haylage and even baleage. We'll talk a little bit about that. What percent moisture at harvest? That's, that's very critical as to whether the finished product is going to be successful. And uh, trench, bunker, silage, we want 65 to 70% moisture, uh, 60 to 70% on the ag bag. Upright, you want a little bit lower. Anyone know why? Anyone ever fill it upright with corn silage? What comes out the bottom end if you put it in too wet? An awful lot of juice. <laughs> And I can remember going inside and rolling the inside of those tanks with linseed oil just to keep the rust factor down, right? And so, and the, the acidic, you know, we're looking at very acidic juice, right? Vinegar kind of, kind of approach to that. So anyway, we want, we want to try to stay in those ranges as best we can. How do you determine that on corn silage? Anyone remember? What's the test? Milk line test. You know, you watch the kernels and you look for that black layer development. It means that basically physiological maturity has been reached and it's starting on dry down. And again, that you've reached the, the, the maximum amount of uh, benefit that you can get from the growth period on that corn as far as nutrients. And also, you want the moisture to be right when you put it in. Here's a, tr here's a trench here uh, showing you how well that's packed. One thing I noticed about that, you see the greener material on top? Uh, that capping is really important, especially on an open trench or bunker. Uh, we would even on our uprights, we would cap with a greener material um, just to make sure we had good seal. Good seal is critical. If we look at... Um, uh, haylage moisture ranges, um, again that was corn silage, so here's haylage, a little bit different, uh, 50 to 65 percent moisture, this is moisture again, um, so a little bit, uh, we have a little bit more dry matter in our haylages. Look at the ag bag there, 50 to 65, I mean, and, and then baleage, real critical, you don't want to go below 40, so you got to be above 40 if you're going to go with an ag bag, there's just no chance to make haylage, <laughs> you'll make other things, but you won't make haylage uh, if you go at the too dry on that baleage side, it's really critical. Uh, you can get away a little bit easier on some of the uprights and bigger ones with a little bit drier material, again, as long as it's capped, because you're trying to limit oxygen, right? That, that whole idea of solid making is an anaerobic process. You've got to limit, eliminate oxygen. You've got to get it very, very well packed 
into a very dense package and then wrap very well if you're going to go with the plastic approach with the, the ag bag. It's easy for a 100 foot bag to be worth 20 grand with when it's got alfalfa in it. So again, it's, it's valuable. And you can see there are different diameters I have there. Eight foot is about uh, one ton per linear foot. A 10 foot round diameter bag is about a one and a half foot. I think that's an eight foot bag there. And then 12 foot bag is about uh, two tons per linear foot. So you got a pretty good indication of, you know, once you pack that, uh, that big tube there, that you got a pretty good idea of what the feed value and the quantity. And then of course you do your testing, right? With solids, um, again, solid special round baler. Anyone ever tried to put up a heavier bale, like 45, 50%? And, uh, you better have a solid special round baler. It's pretty difficult otherwise. And then, of course, net wrapping and is very important. Net wrap on the bale itself and then plastic wrap, uh, too. And again, in that range, critical, 45 to 65%. There's no, there's no playing around on the low end. And above 70, you're going to be in trouble, too. So, so you've got to really be critical. that you. So how do you test for those moistures? Right? You can do the microwave method. It works very well. Uh, these slides will be online, so you can go back to that later, or you can just Google it. And then uh, you can see you've got some pretty fancy solid uh, testers there to accurately determine moisture. Right? Basically cook it down, weigh it, pr weigh it prior, and cook it until it doesn't lose water anymore, and then you've got your dry matter uh, portion. And that's really critical. Then you know how much moisture is there. So let's talk a little bit about fermentation. We're, we're early on, when you cut, uh, go out and chop corn, you know that it's going to heat up very quick. There's a respiration stage. It's actually using up all that available oxygen. Respiration of the plant material itself and the bacteria that's present are very actively um, using up that oxygen. Eventually, if we do our job right and we pack it right, seal it right, it goes anaerobic. And that's the fermentation stage. And that's when lactic acid and acetic acids. And there's two types of fermentation bacteria, homo fermenters and hetero fermenters. Um, they're pretty much all are common in the, in the environment, so they're, they're probably the least common would be the lactobacillus uh, buccineri. But um, the others are very much um, in the environment, uh, but we can add them, and I will talk about that too, how we inoculate with appropriate bacteria. Uh, you'll notice that um, the homo fermenters will produce only lactic acid. That's their end product. Of course, we're getting the pH down with lactic acid. That's what does the pres preserving. But no other things can exist in that low pH, around four and a half is what we're shooting for, uh, under five. And then, of course, the lactis buccinari is actually very good um, at producing acetic acid and even some ethanol and carbon dioxide uh, from, of course, from these would be the off gas of that. So fermentation then, this anaerobic process is the exclusion of all air. I would recommend single bales, double, triple wrap if you really want total exclusion of air. That's a lot of material, but we, it, it's worthwhile to do that. Uh, fermentation ceases when these acids get to a certain pH level, usually around 3.5, and then you pretty much have something that's preserved until air gets to it. And so you've got, I've got some Haley's and Sally's in there. They don't smell too bad right now. It's, it kind of reminds me of home a little bit, but in a little while they're going to get spoiled pretty quickly because air has already been introduced to them and they're going to get, they get butyric acid pretty quickly and that's rot, that rotten butter smell starts to come out and that's not a very pleasant smell, <coughs> butyric acid. So important solids quality goals You'll see on, I got the legumes on one side and the corn on, the, on this side. Let's see if this pointer works here, legumes. And it shows you where the pH should be, depending upon where you put that product up. And this is actually on dry matter now, so it's a flip here. You've got to think of the inverse of what we talked about the other, the other way. Um, but you'll notice that um, we want pH to go down to 4.5. Um, it's acceptable up to 5. Uh, 5 is questionable once you go above that as to what other um, bacterial and fungi and other things might be growing in there at that point, mold and different things. So we got to keep that acid level that low. It needs to be at least 2% um, lactic acid. A total of 5% acids is what you're shooting for in the finished product. And a lot of times these evaluations will show you those acids. Although I don't see it on these particular tests that Jeff, I should mention Jeff Semler and I kind of, he's, he was, um, I was hoping he was going to come down with me. But he ended up, he couldn't make it, and, but he did send the sample. So these are Jeff samples out of farmers up in Western Maryland area in Washington County. And uh, what I did notice is that when they run the test on the silages, unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't see the total acids on there. That would have been one of the part of the test that I would have requested to have see total acids because that's very critical as the storability of those products. The, uh, and you'll see the, the corn silage range is a little bit lower than the haylage range. You notice that right away when you look at the, uh, oops. Go back here. The lower, a little bit lower here on the corn soil side than on the halo side on their um, acidic uh, uh, pH uh, low, lows. 
Relative feed value, that becomes very, anyone who have dealt with forages knows that relative feed value is very critical to making quick determinations and working with your nutritionist to develop that TMR um, into something that is fully balanced. So we need to know things like relative feed value is what we focus on. Relative feed value makes really good sense on legumes and grasses. Probably doesn't work as well in corn silage. So sometimes you'll see on the sheets it's absent. It's not typically as thought of as being as critical to look at relative feed value. But on all your, um, your, your, your grass forages and alfalfa and legume forages, relative feed index is a very important tool. What you're looking at is digestible dry matter and it's estimated by acid detergent fiber test. So we get to our percent acid detergent fiber and we use that to get to digestibility. What's, what's digestible in this, in this feed ration? Readily digestible through the rumen system, right? And then you have the, the other part is how much can the animal possibly take? This is where each mouthful counts. And that's measurement of the neutral detergent fiber and that's estimating how much potentially can this cow literally eat and fill her belly before she's satisfied and too full to take in another bite. Right? And they do a great job of eating, but they do come to you know the meal's end every time. And we want to make sure that they got enough of a high, very high value feed in that. So if we get any of these out of line, either percent ADF or, or NDF, uh, we'll typically see we'll drop in milk production. Okay, So we got to make sure we have them in these ranges. And here's an interesting, you got some um, constants in here to actually get to an equation where you can get the ADF, the digestible dry matter, um, uh, by, by using the ADF, and then the, the dry matter intake by using the NDF. And then the relative fee val value is just a function of those two divided by this constant 129. And so then you can actually go through the test here, and here's an example, 28% ADF plugged into that formula. It gives you 67.1 digestible um, uh, dry matter. And then you get 35 on the bottom with the NDF term. Um, you get 3.43 and you got a relative fee value of 178. Now that's an excellent uh, product. Anything above 160 is certainly excellent. So we've got this alfalfa halage here. I'll go ahead and pass this around and just give you, this is a really nice forage sample. And uh, I thought we would just dive into it a little bit and take a look at it. First of all, if it's halage and alfalfa hay, if we looked at hay before, just in the field, we would like for it to be about 21 to 22 percent crude protein. This would be considered a good dairy hay, good dairy alfalfa. 28% ADF, 35% NDF. So um, if you look at that, that would be ideal because if you do that math, that calculation that I showed before with that number 28.35, you would be in that 170 to 180 relative feedback. Now you see on this chart that I dissected out of that page that's going around with that sample, uh, that we've got, uh, first of all, we've got dry matter on there and moisture at 43%. So, we're under that 60% uh, of um, dry matter. The, um, we got crude protein of 19.8, which is actually pretty good. So it's not the 22 or 21, so it's not, but the crude protein is high enough that we can offset that with, you know, nutritionists uh, for some soybean meal in there, or some cotton seed meal or something to bring that protein up. But what's really critical is when we get down there and look at that relative feed value, it's actually quite low. And so uh, this, this one would take quite a bit more. Uh, we look at ADF and the NDF numbers down there. You see that 41.7 to 46.1. That's quite higher than what the range we like to see on that uh, ideal cage. And so we got down into a fairly <coughs> low, low relative C value. That doesn't mean that that feed can't be used. You just have to build that TMR around that feed, right? You add more protein supplements, add a little bit more, certainly uh, more digestible. Uh, you probably get into some of that crack core or something to bring that digestibility up a little bit and eventually get to where you want with the TMR. So that's, that's what nutritionists do. They kind of, every year is a little different. This has certainly been a challenging year to make hay in silage, and so you would anticipate uh, there's a lot more adjusting to the TMR rations. Here's an example of corn silage. Now, you might, probably don't want to open up these corn silage in hay. They're probably, uh, they've been frozen, but uh, that's all quickly. And you also don't like dairy farmers. <laughs> so just hands on gingerly, don't open. And um, you'll see, but let's like, take a look at corn silage. The first thing that's important is, and I didn't mention the other, the other pH was in the right range on that alfalfa. We actually have a very good pH down here on these corn silage, the ones going around now. Um, it has, uh, again, we typically don't use the, the uh, relative feed value index on this. We typically go to TDN, total digestible uh, nutrients, and then some of the energy, the lactation energy is typically something we look at for that. You also notice it does have pretty good protein level. And if you look over here at the ideal corn silage, 
Um, this is I took out of these. You have good core solids, you have poor core solids. You see crude protein. Um, actually, this is even better. This is better than the 8.6, so it's got good crude protein. The NDF and ADF ranges, uh, 46, 26, and they should be below those numbers, uh, would be better. So over here we have um, ADF, we have below that and below. So we actually have very good numbers for digestibility, the lower better. And so in this case, we've got uh, very good digestible products. In fact, poor, you see, you will go up to higher end numbers on these uh, percent. Um, uh, also notice that it's um, a little less cellulistic, a um, little lower lengthened. So actually, that's a fairly good uh, corn solid that's going around the earth. You also notice, if you look at it close, they use a kernel processor. And so when I used to make corn solids, we had the big old plump kernels pretty visible in there. And that kernel processor does a really nice job of getting those sugars and starches out into that full fermentation body. And actually does a much better job of preserving as well as making more digestion. So a very, very important part of that. What often goes wrong in silage? Well, a lot of people wrong. Uh, we cut the wrong stage of the and weather weather's a big problem with that typically. Uh, especially with the halages and alfalfa. When I used to work alfalfa, I wanted to cut every 28 days. I didn't want weather to impact me, right? 28 days, five days. Like clockwork, of course, it doesn't work like that in the real world. Um, sometimes we get um, we get a round barrel and it doesn't make it makes a low bale density, especially a low bale density center. You want that thing to be tight and firmly packed right from the beginning all the way through. Or you're not going to don't make bailings without that. You've got to have a hard center. Some of these bales don't do a good job of starting out with a really hard center. And when you have that, you're going to see more of that white mold develop and problems. White mold is, and black mold themselves might not be toxic, but that's certainly an indication that you did get fermentation. They wouldn't grow if that was the acid level below it. Bailing too wet. Big problem with clostridia. We'll talk about that one. Um, if you go above 70%, don't grasp it off. <laughs> Roll it back out and wait for it to dry down. Don't wrap it. And uh, again, on the other end, if it goes below 40%, don't wrap it up either. More likely, you won't get fermentation and you have mold development, right? Yeast and all those other secondary. How fast you got to move, you do it. You need to have a full windrow too, right? I mean. Well, no, I meant rapid. Oh, yeah, yeah that's actually. Yeah, the, during that respiration phase, it's really critical to get those wagons or get it wrapped or whatever means. Line wraps as it is. Yeah, you need to get it right in there. That's a really good point. So, what is the risk of fermentation problems that goes wrong? Botulism, botulism. Um, again, that's soil contamination. Why would you have soil contamination? Good. Yeah, soaking wet, rain splash, and I mean, right now, even flooding, right? You get a lot of soil up into the ear where the water was that high on the corn. So yeah, you can know, get a really big problem, especially if we don't get fermentation. Uh, listerosis, um, nitrogen, again, uh, feces and rotted vegetation. So again, you, know, you can, you can self-exasperate that cycle, you know, by inappropriately putting things out in the field too close to harvest. Uh, toxins and mycotoxins, yeast, mold, bacteria, bacillus, aflatoxins, aspergillus, all of them are when we think of those aflatoxin effects uh, from uh, bacteria and fungi. And right now with the flooding concern, I don't know if anyone got this uh, note that came out from the uh, veterinary, uh, out of the FDA, but it's basically prompted by the veterinary medicine society uh, and the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And basically any of these fields that get flooded, uh, they, they, they have such higher tests, or they have such higher chances of some of these problems that testing is really critical. So test the finished product, test it before it gets wrapped up in, in soil, and test the finished product too. And they have a list there of the things that you need to uh, test the aflatoxins, even some heavy metals if you have that concern. So the clostridium uh, and the botulinum, again, the, the tough ones that you have to worry about. Anyone ever see cattle die from botulinum? Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's pretty gruesome. It's happening very quickly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, you, you dropped off. We've had whole, you know. Yeah. I thought hay underwater. No, that's corn here. Yeah, yeah. You can bet that there's a chance that, that up inside that world that you've got some contamination to deal with. Now, solids. Uh, the age fermentation um, again. Uh, Sometimes if they're needed when situations when the forage material is drier than recommended. When it's a cold weather cut, I remember we used to put it on our first cutting alfalfa. We pushed that envelope. We would cut it last week of April. Up in, up in, up in, up in, so that was all we wanted to add some of these uh, 
especially like the bacillus. And the crop's been rained on or soil contaminated. You want to have as quick a fermentation and as good a fermentation as possible mm -hmm. with that product to avoid spiking up those bad actors that we showed before. Because they're going to be there, you know, and the botulism is ever present. You know, so they're even nasty, they're ever present. So we can do a good, um, we can, by using these inoculants at the proper time, and for some of these riskier environments, um, you, you typically need to add. We would add any of these. The interesting thing, the homo fermenters, again, they just drive to a seed cap, this is the and uh, Pentecostal, and then you have down the, the hetero fermenters, and the Bichneri is really interesting because that one actually improves stability in aerob aerobic conditions. So I, I think that's really critical. If you get good fer fermentation using um, the head of a fermenter, you actually actually have a spike uh, shelf life, if you will, once they've been exposed to oxygen. So that's really critical when you're feeding off the end of a bag or you're feeding off um, uh, feeding round bales, maybe that a little bit of compromise maybe in the plastic by the time you feed them. And so you can, uh, uh, again, there's really good uh, reasons to put in lactobacillus pichneri. And when you know that you're going to maybe feed uh, the less than the face, less than a foot of face a day on a trench silo, might be a good reason to put, put this one in there. So it's a really good strategic reason why to use um, different inoculants, especially the, the head of the um, So let's switch gears to look at the solid hay. Hay moisture is uh, something that you, uh, uh, you, know, you can't ignore when we're making hay out there. Dry hay, 15%, that's our goal. 14% actually for really dense uh, round bales, big dense round bales. You really want to be under 15% uh, moisture. Because it's just can get more development uh, in that tight packed environment sometimes. Just, we're just talking about hay now, we're not talking about wrapping or anything. Um, never stack hay wetter than 17%. I was reluctant to put that because I know I've stacked hay at close to 20%. <laughs> without preservatives, but it never really comes out well, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking if you really want, you really should be thinking, if you know hay's going to be above 70%, you should be thinking about putting preservatives on that. And some, you'll see people say 18%, 19%, but I don't know, it seems like every time I wrapped up something up in that range and didn't put the preservatives on it, we ended up with some moldy conditions in the hay. It's probably feedable, feeding, you know, probably wasn't that bad, but well, still not what you typically want out there. Uh, propionic acid, probably the biggest one you use. There's, uh, there's certainly other ones. Um, they will reduce mold. Um, of course, they're buffered now. They don't, they're not nearly as corrosive as they used to be. They've got great application systems, fairly cheap application systems now. They click on different nozzles based upon moisture with the moisture test that's coming in the bail can. Yes, sir. How do you clean the bail around? You know, most of the guys just run straw or something like that. Just run some cold straw. Yeah, just run some straw or some clean hay back through it. That's doesn't have any propionic acid on it. And then maybe wash the outside a little bit around the, around the front. And then maybe... It won't grow. It, yeah, it's not nearly... You change the color of the paint. Yeah, it's not nearly It'll like... It'll take the skin off your fingers, but it won't hurt the paint. Yeah, it's, and it is. It's, 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 it is a lot more flexible than you I've got guys, they say that it's not really... They don't see any extra damage on the bailers. Mm -hmm. From it, from it. So. And they've been using it. You know, the, um, and they got ranges now, and you really want to make sure that you're putting the proper amount of acid on. You see the acid ranges there with percent hay. So if you're really getting out here 25 percent hay, you need to be putting a lot of acid in there with that in order to make that preservative work. Uh, they, they're great for reducing drying time, which you typically don't get around or anywhere in the East, in the East Coast. And uh, uh, of course, uh, rain damaged hay too. They actually can uh, can help uh, the rain damaged hay at least preserve the quality that it has. It won't go any worse. Than that. Um, certainly can reduce leaf loss because we can bail, especially something like alfalfa. When you get down to 15% moisture in alfalfa, you're shattered a lot of leaves, right? And so now you want to go with good hay leaves. And uh, so again, you put that again. So got alfalfa, that's, this is over at Kennedyville Horizon. Again, a TMR there. You can see the forage, that's a forage based uh, ration, there's no doubt about that. Let's look at another example. This is a hay sample um, out of a legume forage. Uh, this is dry alfalfa, very nice hay. And, uh, and so then we kind of dissect this seed a little bit. Um, I don't know why I put the solid stain. Ignore the solid stain on the bottom. But you'll notice that we got, we want crude protein to be between 20, uh, 21 and 22%. See where the crude protein is on that one? 28.9. That's about as high as anything I've seen. So what does that tell you automatically about that hay? Before you even see it. Alfalfa. What else? What does it tell you? Very good. Very, very, yeah, excellent. And also, it's got a lot of leaves. 
which means somebody did a good job bailing out out. <coughs> so again, they probably put that up on the dryer side. I don't know if that's been, I didn't ask Jeff about additives or not, but it doesn't look like it. It's not, it doesn't have quite have that color that I might see if I saw the propionic acid on it. It kind of gets that kind of limeish lime color or what have you. The, um, it's got a very high crude protein, very, fairly, you notice it is, uh, the moisture is a little bit high. Um, so 17.5% moisture, uh, which means uh, that that's probably why the leaves are on there, right? <laughs> that's very good. Uh, uh, moisture side. Looks like it cured it well. It looks like it's got uh, fairly good uh, TDN, and then you get down here to this relative P value, 192, right? That's exceptional alfalfa hay that you're looking at right there. Worth 20, and if I was a dairy farmer, that's the one I'd want in my ration, right? That's the goal. That's the end game when it comes to alfalfa. Uh, I, actually, in Russia, uh, I, I got my research uh, degree in alpha, working in rotations in and out of alfalfa. No and we, when we think about alfalfa, you know, we, we've got some amazing, I was a decal dealer for about five or six years, and I remember watching the advancement of, of alfalfa through the years, in the 80s and the 90s. And we've really got some really nice alfalfa out there. Quick recovery, multi-leaf yield capability. We were cutting six times in, in the Annapolis area. You know, five times regularly and six times in mean, some years. And, and we still get good yields off, off the fields for five years. Fertility with alfalfa, well-drained, pH 6.8, high calcium index. Alfalfa roots only one ratio of calcium to magnesium. To keep that in mind when you think about a crop with a legume, especially how much more calcium you're removing versus magnesium when you're lining. Okay, so high cal lime synthesis. Weed-free fields, use herbicides. Of course, I'm a weed con I like to talk about weed control. Uh, herbicides are pretty great, and I'll show you some examples. And then you control the weeds during the dormant periods, too, and even between cuttings. Uh, it's real critical. This is the old way we used to do it, 1987. That's me out there hopping off the spray rate, getting ready to actually put in a product called Bayland. And that requires killing. So I had to come back, hop off there as soon as I get done, and the disc and roller is ready. And they're going to go ahead and, and work that even down further. That's been plowed. It's probably been disc, oh, four times, disc and roll two or three more times. You know, you just don't get to that without an awful lot of intensive work. But look what it looks like when you get done. You know, that's the picture of that at the farm. You can stand back and be pretty proud about planting like that, except when you get two inches of rain <laughs> right after you get done. But it's a beautiful system, and they always tell you you should be able to walk across like it's on the moon and just leave just the base. Of not much more than the heel and a little bit of your footprint. So you know that did it right, right? I mean, that's kind of evidence that that old silk loan uh, turned out pretty good. And this is what we would typically get with those kind of plants. As long as we didn't get, well, we get a little gully and real early in some places. But most of the time, if we got lucky, we'd get, um, uh, when, when do you guys plan out that? Who knows when to plan? What's your favorite day? Uh, August 8th is mine. It had to be between the 8th and the 12th. Early May. Okay. Early May. Yeah, I tried the spring. I just always prefer the. Uh, I always prefer the. And then uh, here's what you want to do. You want to make sure you use 20, 25 pounds of seed, inoculated, treated. You can cut that rate down a little bit lower with a drill, but not much. Seed platement again, really important in that hunting pack soil and that top upper one eighth to one quarter of inch soil on top of it, and make sure you inoculate. It and also the trace, I'll show you with size and trace elements and lignin and all those kind of things. It's, you know, it's a high dollar investment. And you gotta do it right. So here's all those seed seed treatments and seed inoculants. There's my notes I still want to put right on the what setting to put on on the uh, side of the, of the drill. And that was my favorite drill. We got that drill in 1990, and uh, I really became amazed at what it could do. I mean, we really were 100% no-till when we got this drill. And, uh, and again, be able to, and with this one, we able to that box up the front to singulate out and put forages in there. But for the first time. Well, we could successfully successfully no scale alfalfa when this drill came up because of that gauge real placement. That's the key to it. And this is my first alfalfa drill. It's just as good as any of those three in the And uh, so that was 1991. Fertilizer, you got to can 1,200 pounds. I know we're supposed to use nutrient management and everything, but you can't uh, you can't forgo not fertilizing alfalfa very heavily if you're going after six cuttings, and and you're pushing towards 12 tons of dry matter. You've got to be up in that kind of that kind of range to do it. Um, so again, uh, uh, always put boron, and now sulfur is even more critical. Um, always put sulfur at one um, one to twelve or one to ten ratio of nitrogen. So for every pound of nitrogen, or every twelve pounds of nitrogen, you put one pound of 
enough software. Okay? Uh, use that rule of thumb. Uh, right now, there's just not enough software out there, especially this year. See software deficiencies this year? I saw them. Really interesting places, too. And it's because of all that rain washing that software out, just like it washes the right Cutting every 28 days, um, five to six cuttings a year, not on the not, not question, especially if you get an early start. Um, you will stress the stand, but we're not actually longevity more than about five years, and I've found that you can put that much stress on it, and uh, short of the weather stresses, um, the stand will do pretty well with the new height, uh, these new values out there. So now you can see, can you see how this is planted? Yeah, that's a drill, isn't it? That's not debris. You see those drill growth out there? Also, you notice, remember I said every mouthful counts? You notice this end of the field, the other end of the field, that hay, that there is no variation in those hay that they're doing. That is pure 100% alfalfa from one end to the other end, and that just doesn't happen. So, I think that's a lot of herbicide. And then, of course, the drilling, we were able to really, um, really do a pretty phenomenal job with alfalfa. When you're drying that alfalfa, make sure you, you got to reduce leaf loss. Um, and during curing, keep the, the hay as tight as you can to avoid the color loss, too, and the, and the quality of the and everything like that. And then, of course, so as tight as you possibly can keep the swath, that's what you want based on the drying conditions. You know, the idea is you want the leaves and the stem to dry at the same rate. Very difficult process with alfalfa. Leaves always want to dry stuff, but swathing is very important to that. And then turning, we can have an inverter. We had all kinds of, we had tenors, we had bail, we had the, the old bail rakes, we had the uh, the inverter that would come along very nicely and just turn it over, real soft and gentle. And so you know, sometimes these different tools make all the difference in keeping that loss down to, it would be nice to have, um, we almost always guarantee 25% leaf loss, but you want to stay below 50. You want to stay below 50. If you get above 50, that guarantee, that's much closer to 20, 25%. And anywhere near 50. And that's going to make a difference in that relative feed value that day. Um, sweet potato, I mean, a leaf, a leaf popper, and sweet that. Anyone ever use it? Anyone ever sweep out the house? Oh, this is my fun pass. I take my trail 90 out, take my leaf, and then I go around different fields and do my sweep that in two weeks after the cutting. And that's when I would make my determination whether I need an insecticide. And, and with, in the spring, the first cutting, you go out the next day and you make sure you get green up because of weed. Right? So those are the two you're watching for. And you better make, pay attention to them. If the field deal tears yellow and any time you've lost that yield and probably the next cutting, then you may have completely injured that crop that might not produce that year. So you can't, you got to be an alpha farm. This is not an organic crop, okay? Not here, not in this, not in this part of the world. They do have some varieties that are hopper farm resistant. They're, they're resistant, they still get it. Uh, they call leaf bar varieties. Um, I don't see too many of them growing. Most people will just spray for hoppers and fresh and weevils when they approach the threshold. So know those thresholds, get out there and do that sweeping and find out what, what's going on. When it's time to, uh, uh, to take uh, alfalfa out of the program or, or actually keep, you know, get out there, usually around that two week period, you know, is a great time to go over it. You won't even notice it that you drove through it by the time you get to the four weeks. And so it's a great time to think about making those reactions. Five years, you do bowl for alfalfa. Maybe on the fifth year, you might want to overseed it. And that's a great time to introduce a grass. It kind of looks like this. You notice it's still weed-free. Well, how do we do that? Herbicide, right? Okay, use the, the Belfar, the metric using the sin bars, all those kind of things. Uh, all those different things, lots of different cuttings. It still ends up with weed-free sand every five years. At the same time, it's probably when You'll notice it's declining in yield. Yeah. Um, so at that time, it's a great time. Over top of the orchard grass, there you go, same field, 50 50. It's about 50% orchard grass, 50% alfalfa, really nice mixed hay. I take a closer look at that, and you can see it's pretty nice hay. So you really change. You've, you've taken that field, and then you can take it for another three more years easily before you rotate that out of the field. So a very nice way to extend and get a nice hay crop. So here's the mixed hay, some haylage, mixed forage. Here's the haylage. I could have easily been that one there that we just saw in the paper, but it's not. But you can see we can get um, with the one that I'm passing around. Uh, we have uh, dry matter 20%. Uh, which actually, it's actually too dry, probably, but that happens sometimes. Um, it's got pretty high ADF and NDF. 
and it's, it's actually probably got a pretty high pH, but it's almost borderline. You can see that down here in the relative pH. So it actually looks better than it is, actually. When you look at it in the bag, you might say that looks like really good haley. But it's probably it's on the tough side, probably a little bit too dry, probably didn't ferment quite as well. It did ferment, but not quite as well as it should have. And, uh, and that suffered, you suffered by the loss of some of that uh, lactation energy and also the feed value of that, of that particular product. Let's think a little bit about wood thread. Oh, good. It's going pretty good. That's good. Um, all kinds of problems out there with orchard grass. We've had strategy meetings and everything trying to, to develop, figure out why we can't keep orchard grass like the usual in the mid Atlantic region. A lot of problems, and there's just a, a short list of the things that are probably doing the most damage out there. Uh, the white grubs, the wireworms, the bill bugs, the curios, drink basic, genitoids, then the anthrax, the the brown stripes, and the yellow dwarf. Who's seen yellow dwarf in orchard grass? It's more common out there than you, than you talk about yellow dwarf and barley. But there's a nice harvest of orchard grass that's going on right there. And we've got some newer varieties now. Um, uh, I actually did a, a, a test on some of them. I, we have time to see it. Uh, for example, King Agri Seed, pretty nice viable new one. Make sure you get germinated tested seed, like Benchmark Plus. Make sure you have a certified tag on those bags. I see a lot of stuff out there sold without certification. Okay, they, 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 you know, they might have a germ test, but they don't have a, a certification. The, um, Orchard grass, uh, again, we're also uh, thinking about uh, using some of these new uh, mixtures with these novel endophytes, right? Um, the Bar Optimas and the Max Q's and the Jessup's and all those. Um, again, and also we might want to think about mixing them with you know, bluegrasses and, and Timothy and other legumes. The orchard grass, sometimes by itself, is not the best crop, although there's a good market that's pure orchard grass, and it's, uh, there's a pretty good market for them. It's a pretty, a pretty good head. The main thing when we get into these um, cool season grasses is many, know when to cut. You need 45 days of active growing time for that crop. The crop has to be actively growing for 45 days before you cut it. And you also want to make sure that you leave at least, I like to leave at least four inches. It's probably better to leave five or six inches if you can't stumble like that. So you get good and active regrowth. And so you'll, you'll get that regrowth that you need. And you also notice that you can't accumulate 45 days in this period. Right? So you just can't do it. So you have to make your cutting early. It needs to be in that first week of May to be able to get good 45 year, days of growth period. So look up here on the, on the orchard grass. You see that growth period here. You cannot get that 45 days out to July if you cut first of May. If you wait and cut June, then you don't get 45 right? You might not even pick up 45 days until you get back over here in August. So that's why you get that second cut way late. Well, that's true. That's why you make baileys. That's why you learn how to make baileys and haylies and all this kind of thing. Not get very, that's right. But I'm just saying, if you really want a good second cutting, you need to push that May cutting right at the beginning. And that's the one you make the baileys or the haylies on. Then you get a good, good second cutting because you have the 45 days required of growth to get a good second cutting. If not, if you cut late, you don't get a good second cutting. It just goes dormant. Right? right? And then you have to wait for that pickup again in the fall because you'll see enough hay out there to produce it. So that is a nice cutting. It actually got off. That's actually pretty early. That's probably about May 5th. You sometimes get those windows, and you take advantage of them. Get nice hay. Let's take a look at grass hay here, and uh, the last sample I have. And this is uh, here coming around. You'll notice it's nice and leafy. Um, it's got um, it's 14% moisture, so you get a good window of making some hay there. I don't know if that's second cutting, but it looks like second cutting. Does it say on there? It just says grass, right? It doesn't, doesn't give any other. So we'll call it which grass looks like it. And it's got nice leafy material, and it looks like it might be second cut. Come down here to the relative feed value, 94. 94. The average relative feed value of grass A is 85. That's the average. So what does I tell you about this sample more now? It's premium orchard grass, right? At least from a feed value standpoint. It's got fairly low ADF, and the NDF is a little bit high, but not too, not too out of the question. And it's certainly dry. Got pretty good protein, 12.3% protein. Very good uh, for orchard grass. That kind of thing. So again, to me, that's a nice, very nice quality hay. You really don't know not, nothing. You really don't know anything about that hay until you do this, right? Okay. Until you test. And you know what? We've got to get these farmers testing hay. They should be testing these forages out here. 
And uh, we just, you know, it's not that hard to do. You send the sample in, they send you the results back. You know, and it's two days. And there's no reason why we're, you know, we've got great markets for hay, and even hayage and baleage to some extent. And why can't we get out here and test a little bit more often and find out? Because you can't do it, you really don't know, other than just watch the animal perform. And that's kind of not the best way to do it. That's not the best approach, right? Here's a tall fescue field I worked on for quite some time. It was a mess. It had horse nettle and jimson weed, and it was really overgrazed. And we finally backed off the cattle a little bit and said, let's see if we can't make this thing into something. And so I worked on it for a long time. It's predominantly tall fescue. And, uh, and it would actually have been one to be concerned about because it's not one of the novel parts. And I came in there, and of course, we need to look around. And I've seen cattle with toxicosis, right? And we don't need to understand fescue toxicosis. And we need to understand the erratic behaviors that they start. Whenever they start making mud holes, it look like African buffalo <laughs> wallowing. You know you've got problems with uh, fescue toxicity. They start seeing the holes at the time, too. When they just stand in water or get down in mud and chomp around, they're trying to they got use urine, urine, their own urine, and they make these mud piles. And they're trying to cool their hooves. So that's, they're, they're, the hooves are sensing on clock. And so they're trying to do that. So that's why they very, very erratic behavior out there. They quit eating. They'll look at that same pasture and they'll quit eating it. And that's a really good sign. When they're standing out in something like that and they want to eat it, they need to start, you need to test. What do you do? Well, you can't test for that. Uh, there's some stains of uh, showing the, um, uh, the, the endofungus with inside the, it's actually intracellular between the cellular area. Well, well there, look for these signs, and then also there are places you can send samples. You can actually test C, too. But by just um, blending, in this case, we took this field, and now it was tall fescue, and even though I didn't kill it all down, I just used herbicides to get the weeds under control, and I came in here and I put orchard grass, and there is even clover down in here, the diamond. So we changed this field completely to the point now where they're not eating pure fescue, so that when that endophyte rears up its ugly head with those endotoxins, um, then you don't have um, you don't have you have enough other forage in there that the blend itself can alleviate the, the difficulty. You can see weight gain by just mixing. And then, then the, and of course, if you got horses, close grazers, you probably want bluegrass and tall fescue with the diet. So that's actually my lawn. That's what I shoot for in my lawn. I love clover in my lawn. They don't have to do anything, so I just mow it. All right. So that's my perfect lawn. This year. Uh, I kind of like that. The best. Anyone ever plant a random white clover? It's a very low growing. White clover is really excellent for that. Durant, Durano. Durano. Yeah, it's excellent for horses because it's very low stoloniferous mm -hmm. and it, it, it's really, a, you, you wouldn't want to make hay out of it. Patriot white clover would be the one to make hay out of it. Durano's down there and intertwines very well, fills in very nicely. And persist even through the heat pretty well, which is kind of nice. So again, you push the cloth from across, cloth or a jessup, a uh, tall max, you know, to, you could renovate that whole thing and make sure you don't have any of the problems, right? Um, but the reason of course, Timothy, anyone know Timothy? What do you have to watch out for Timothy? Mites are a problem. Yeah, they Some sure are. Variety. This Depends is typically on what it looks like. Stuff. That's not ground injury. No, it's not. That's rough mites. Yeah. You know, you can go out in the field, it could be muddy ground. You know, it could be wet, springtime. And you'll still start to see this. These mites are very cold tolerant. They're, they're a winter type mite, actually. They do most of their damage in March. So you need to actually spray that field in March at green on yeah. And you need to have them scouting. Timothy rough mites get down in those real deep grooves. It also gets an orchard grass and all the other grasses too, but it's really problematic on these Timothy parents. And it's, it actually causes that drought. So we gotta get out there early, we gotta look for them, and then we've gotta treat them, and that's gotta be done the first week of March. So if you wanna grow Timothy, 7XL. That's all you need, pretty cheap product, pretty easy to use. You spray it March 1st. You know, you get out there, you find them, they'll be there, and you, you got thresholds for them, and then you go ahead and spray it. And usually that one time, because it's a cold weather mite, once it heats up in the season, if you get them under control then, you won't have a problem with Timothy rush mite typically going into the summer. Unless you have an abnormally cool April in there. Oh, barley. That's me a few years ago, and uh, barley crop. And uh, well, I, the last, I didn't have a, uh, one of the last samples that didn't, have, but didn't, have, didn't end up in the cooler, was um, using a, a wheat silage. And of course, you could use any of the small grains. Uh, we typically put up more rylage than anything. Uh, for dairy. Usually it was an emergency feed. But the interesting thing about it is um, because it's in the grass family, it actually has um, a very good L uh, R um, a relative feed index, right? A 122. So that's a very high quality uh, wheat crop. And so we can do a really good job with these rileages and, and, and very consistently too. We cut them at the right stage, boot stage. We can really consistently come up with some really nice 
um, of the small grain silage. And so here's a good example of one. You'll notice that the moisture content, uh, are about 80, 85% moisture, so actually pretty wet. You almost expect some of the, the slime molding problems that you would have out of it, but it actually turned out quite well. A very low pH, which means the fermentation was very good. Uh, fairly good TDN, but really down here, this relative feed value because of this digestibility and the amount that they can possibly eat. I mean, that's, the, that's the two components that you're looking at, dry matter intake and digestibility of the dry matter. And that's the relative feed value that you come up with that. that a couple minutes? How are we doing? Three, three, oh, three. Real quick. I'm from Marlboro, put in a research trial, got some appendix and seed, king agri seed entry, and just want to show you how um, to do it, um, do a nice renovation seeding. Came in here with Roundup and an old tall fescue weed, weed plot on the side of the hill. Never done anything with it. Strategically, the only time you can kill uh, wireworms and white grubs and those bugs is you can be creative by planting a millet crop in between and then hit it with lure band, one to two quarts, right? And now you can get rid of those white grubs and those. Do we have any middle clumpers yet for, for grasses? I don't think we have a label yet. That's why I'm waiting for but we don't have it. But anyway, this is I call creative pest control, the word band, using a crop in between to break that tall fescue cycle. I actually use millet instead of sorghum. And so planted millet, round up kill, came back later on, hit it with a knife, now look at that nice. That's a clean slate. <coughs> and so then came in there, and that was on September 4th, hit it with night, came with, with billy goat cedar and overseeded all those different uh, seeding varieties. And with it by October 5th, September 4th, October 5th, had some nice plot development. And there they are October 24th. In that, in that area. And November 12th actually had some pretty nice establishments. We cut it, this is the third year. So that was, was that 2012? Yeah. Three cuttings. This is the third cutting, still very persistent. Okay, so that full renovation approach is what's really needed to break that long time cycle, especially the, the old pesky variety, to get these things established. And so here's just a uh, uh, Olympic Lucy grass, Brockton tall fescue, Patriot white clover, Bale Kentucky blue, Jessup tall fescue, and Patriot White Clover. Um, Bartley's of Timothy, um, Persist Ripley Grass, and Cedar White Clover. And Bartley's of Timothy, Maturi, Maturi Prairie Brome Grass, and Freedom Red Clover. And this was my only four way mix. Be a great horse mixture, very quality, good quality hay. Anyway, I think that's enough for today. <laughs> and um, any, any questions? I guess we have a couple minutes.